Evening, ladies and gents. It's Sam and Brown here. This evening, Keith McClacken is going to be doing the presentation. You find him at Small Caps, and of course, uh, the, the senior equity analyst at Tebe Stockbroking. He's been doing a couple of, of, of sort of valuation models. We've done EV EBITDA, we've done price to book, we've done price earnings, we've done uh, uh, added on to those, we did case studies of each of them. And this evening's purpose really was there are probably there, there are there are dozens, hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of different valuation models. What Keith's really going to run this evening is have a quick squiz of those other ones, see what they are, see how they work, and give us uh, an overrun of that. Um, because we're only running on a single uh, processor, you're welcome to still ask questions. I will only be able to get to them at the end of the presentation because we have to run this off one PC. But with that, I'll hand over to Keith. Thanks, Simon. Hi, guys. Um, and just just to just to touch base on that, um, this is equity fundamentals. So so we're looking at valuations, um, building up to essentially an investment decision. And um, just just run through a, a, a brief reminder. I mean, part, part of education is reinforcement. So we all always do these uh, reminders. The four pillars of fundamentals that lead to evaluation and eventually investment decision is profitability, which is the aim of the business. Liquidity, you're looking at cash. Cash is key. Uh, solvency, debt versus risk. More debt means uh, potentially higher returns, but also more risk. Uh, and then eventually the qualitative aspect, management. You, you are investing in people that run the business. You get different types of valuations. Market ratios. These are, now market ratios are what we've been looking at and we're summing it up, uh, looking at all the miscellaneous, uh, relative, uh, valuation approaches in, in this webinar, but we've looked at price to earnings, price to earnings, price to book, dividend yield, you know, there's peg ratios that go on and on and on. Uh, EBA Badar also is a previous webinar, and I encourage you to go back and look at that because it's a big, complicated acronym, but a very valuable tool. You also get what they call absolute valuation models. Most of, most of you have heard them when they talk about discounted free cash flow, and you also get the dividend discount model. We will, we will move to that. Those, those will consume probably a large part of the next couple of webinars. Um, then, then, Let's just jump straight into the, the relative valuation models. Now, and before I even jump into price earnings growth, what they call the peg ratio, it's, the principle is simple. Relative means that if it moves and it's measurable, you can compare it across companies um, and across sectors and across markets. And that's what it really is. And there's different, you know, there's different relative uh, relative approaches, relative valuation models, and they're not all as good. And they also have different circumstances you want to use them in. So let's jump straight into the peg ratio. We, we've chatted about the price earnings ratio. If you can't remember it, I encourage you to go have a look at, at the theory where we, where we uh, unpack the price earnings model and then the case study where we apply it. The price earnings growth model introduces another element. So first of all, you've got to work out the price earnings ratio. Then you divide it by the company growth rate. And that's why it arrives at the peg ratio, the price earnings growth uh, uh, ratio. So what does it mean? Now, in theory, what the peg ratio is telling you, because a price earnings companies tend to trade in multiples of, of their earnings. But, you know, is that 20 times price earnings cheaper or more expensive than a 10 times price earnings? What happens? Now, your, your, your first thought is, yes, 20 times earnings is, is much more, is much cheaper, uh, much more expensive than, than a 10 times price earnings. It sounds logical. What happens if I told you that the company with the 20 times price earnings had a 100% growth rate for the next, let's you know, say 10, 20 years, but the company with the 10 times price earnings is actually declining. It has a negative growth rate. So instantly you can see that there's a qualitative aspect as well that comes to this. The price earnings growth rate is built around the theory that you should pay one unit for each unit of growth you are buying. In other words, the price earnings should approximate the growth rate of the company. A peg of one implies fair value, a peg of below one implies undervalued, and a peg of above one implies overvalued. A peg of under one means you, you're paying less than one for each single unit of growth you're getting. And, and likewise, over one, you're overpaying for that growth. Now, the problems with the peg ratio is simple. 
it's contained in this side of the equation, the company growth rate. Which growth rate? Over what period? Long term, next year, next five years, next ten years, uh, historics, you know, historics and, uh, so you, and then what do you do? Do you, do you look at revenue? Do you look at profits? Do you look at, uh, so already you can see that the PEG is a very valuable approach when you're understanding companies in, in, in maybe the same sector that are direct competitors, but are different stages. Of, of, of the uh, life cycle. So you might have an early stage company growing incredibly fast and, and a mature company that's growing very slowly. So you can start to, and they will tend to have very different price earnings. It doesn't mean one's more expensive or, or, or one is cheaper than the other, but this is where the peg ratio comes and you can start to compare them on how much are you paying per unit of growth. Um, but you, you, you've got to define your growth rate and you've got to have a consistent one across, across the companies, across your peers and across comparators. Um, there is another problem with a peg, peg ratio. It doesn't necessarily take into account dividends. Maybe a company has very high price earnings, but it pays a very healthy dividend. Another one has a very low price earnings, but doesn't pay dividends at all. So there, there's a way you can start to, they call it the dividend augmented uh, peg ratio. You have price earnings divided by growth rate plus the dividend yield. And once again, dividend yield of it, is it this year, next year, the average of the next 10 years? So I'm giving you tools here, but part of the tool is understanding your weaknesses. And this is why I'm pointing out a lot of the problems. So in a nutshell, the peg ratio is very useful. It's good to have, and it's particularly useful for comparing companies, similar competing and comparative companies, but they're in different growth stages, different life cycles. Other than that, uh, you can start to encounter problems and there's, there's ways to work around them. But it's good to know that the peg ratio exists. Next, we have the price to sales model. How you calculate it is very simple. The market cap divided by the sales of the company. Now, sales is called turnover, it's called revenue, it's called sales, it's called a lot of things, but it's all the same principle. You're taking the top line of the company and, and you see of what multiple is the market cap trading of that. Um, why would you use this? Because if you go back to those four pillars of fundamentals, one of them isn't sales, it's profitability. So it's sales less costs to make those sales. So profits drive business. But sometimes looking at sales is, is a very useful approach. And it's particularly easy. I mean, Facebook listed just the other day, so it's a very good example of where the price to sales model might, 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 might be quite useful. But uh, Facebook is a very good example of where the price to sales model is, is useful because the company is arguably going very fast, but it's also growing its cost base very fast. Um, you, you know, so, so perhaps using, uh, using uh, looking at sales, not looking at profits, would, would be a much, a much better benchmark to compare it versus peers. Um, you know, you use this in early stage, fast growing companies. It's very useful for that, but it does not take into account profitability which it's great if you're growing your sales at you know, um, compounded growth rates in, in 100,000 percent a year. You could do, I mean, maybe you're doing that for years and years, but if you never turn a single cent of profit, who cares? So the price of sales model, very useful, but it has its downfalls. And also, one of its downfalls is careful of comparing the price to sales ratios between companies with very different margins. Uh, now, they might have different margins because they're different growth phases of their, of, of, of their life cycle, but if they're in similar growth phases but they have different margins, you get different returns in equity, you get different, different profits, and actually still profit strive valuation models, not sales. So, plus the sales, useful, it's got its downfalls. You get the dividend yield model. Now, it's simple. It's a dividend per share divided by the share price. You, you arrive at a percentage. So it really says if, if, if the company was static and made exactly the same profit, year on year paid exactly the same dividend, the share price never moved, um, it's actually the interest you're earning from it. I mean, view it like a bank account, view it like a bond. Your dividend yield is, is the money coming to your pocket from, from just holding the stock. So the higher the better, but there's a trade-off between dividends and what they call reinvestment. A company... A company, obviously, would, uh, we prefer to invest in growing companies. So if you're paying a huge dividend, you are actually also depriving your shareholders of taking that same money, putting it back into the business and growing the business faster. So there's a trade-off between higher dividend payouts 
and reinvestment. And often, often a high dividend payout is a symptom of a mature X growth company. So careful. Also, an, another warning sign is not all dividends of the same quality. There's there's a couple of companies off the top of my head. Uh, you know, MoneyWeb did this a while ago. They they paid a dividend and uh, announced it wonderfully, and then never did again. So not all dividends are the same quality, and the quality of the dividend is tends to be dictated by the quality of the profits of the company. If they are truly sustainable. Um, then the dividend will be sustainable. If the profits aren't sustainable, the dividend won't be. Also, dividend yields start to become very useful in, in very mature, high dividend paying stocks. You know, the, the, the prop stocks, the property stocks are, are on JSC are a good example. And growth point versus redefine. They, they're not really, you know, you cannot approach them like uh, growth companies. In fact, they're property stocks. You can't approach them like companies. But they, they serve as a good example where the dividend yields start to become very comparative, very useful uh, to see how much are you paying for what and where. Um, careful also of different dividend policies. I touched on this with dividend versus reinvestment. Dividend, different dividend policies will exist in different companies for different reasons, but it tends to revolve around which stage, where in the life cycle of the growth of the company are they. And as the company starts to become X growth, they start to pay more dividends because they're not growing, so they don't need to reinvest into operations. So different dividend yields in different companies in different life cycles aren't very comparable. So careful of that. And I've touched on the reinvestment versus growth rates in companies. But uh, there is another side. Obviously, dividend yield is limited by you can only compare companies that actually pay dividends. So it only works in dividend paying stocks. Then we've got the price, the price to cash flow model, uh, or re relative ratio. It's simple. It's the market cap divided by the cash flow. Now, I've pointedly been very vague on exactly what this cash flow is. And we'll get to the problem here where, what cash flow is it? Um, so it, it, it's, there, there's a theory in the market that the only real profits are cash, because accounting profits can be manipulated. So the price to cash flow model ignores accounting profits, it ignores one sort of thing, and sometimes it can even take into account capex and reinvestment and things like that. It focuses on the reality of cash. The lower, the better. The price to cash flow model is basically just another price earnings model, but it, instead of earnings, it's using cash flow. But the problem is, and I touched on this uh, just just a little uh, moment ago, which cash flow? Operating cash flow. Free cash flow. Free cash flow tends to be operating cash flow, less working, less capex reinvestment. Um, but which one, and how do you calculate it? And is this historic cash flow or forward cash flow? It can be very different. Um, there's also working capital distortions to valuations. Uh, a good example is, is data tech on our JSC, where when they are growing strongly, their working capital is growing faster because that's the stock goods before they distribute there. So you, so in, in a good year, you'll actually start to see outflows and the price to cash flow ratio will give you the wrong picture. It'll, it'll, it'll be too high or possibly even negative in that case. So take into account working capital distortions. Um, and uh, you know, perhaps using averages or forward-looking uh, forecasts is, is, is a better, better approach to the price cash flow model. is useful, but like I said, it's got its flaws. Then, I mean, we, we touched on a couple of relative ratios there. I'm going to touch, and those are broad. You can use them across sectors. Understand their flaws, because if you understand their flaws, you understand where they're most useful, and you understand where it's lying to you. And you never want to use the wrong ratio at the wrong moment. Um, you also get industry-specific ratios. Now, different industries, remember I said, if there's something quantitative, um, you can start to measure it. And that's, that's what a rate of ratio is built around. Now, let's touch on a couple of these. In the EV avatar model, we touched on what enterprise value is. It's the total financing cost of the business. Equity plus debt, less cash. In the mining industry, you can take enterprise value and divide it by the ounces of reserves in the ground. It's very simple. You're saying, Harmony, you've got a wonderful Papua New Guinea asset. You aren't mining it now, but if I take your entire enterprise value and divide it by the entire ounces um, that you have across your entire uh, portfolio of mines and reserves and everything, and I compare that versus a uh, gold fields, versus a, you know, how much are you paying for those ounces that they haven't dug up in the ground? Now, the risk with this one is that there's different costs to digging up different ounces, there's different yields, there's different time frames, 
And do you use proven reserves, pro uh, probable? Do you use uh, reserves versus resources? So whatever you do, make sure you use a consistent definition of what the ounce is. Those thoughts become very useful as well. In the asset management, you get market care. You can, you can take now all the strange, strange acronym here stands for assets under management. Um, and asset managers charge fees for managing assets. This drives their business. So the more assets they have under management, the more fees they'll be earning, and hence, often, the, the greater their profits will be. So you can take the market cap from the asset manager and divide it by the assets under management, the all, and arrive at a percentage and start to compare that. Compare Katie's to Coronation, compare Coronation to Peregrine, and it starts to become very useful. You also got to understand they have different fee structures, and some of the companies, like Peregrine is a good example, don't just have asset managers. They have brokers in that as well, and private clients and things like that. So you may, be not, you may be not taking into account those businesses, whereas Coronation only has asset managers. So very useful ratio in the financial sector, but not, not, not the only one. Construction. Um, uh, you're currently in a tough construction market, but you can start to take... We're talking about uh, you know, price earnings, prior, price to book, Price to sales, you know, uh, price, to, price earnings growth. In construction, your future of your business is your order book. That is your future revenue. And at least the guys consistently report that. So you can take a price to order book approach. Take the market cap, divide it by the order book. And you can start to compare them versus each other. Careful of the timing, careful of the margins, careful of the composition, and careful of how they define the order book. Because some include... Some include signed contracts in the order book. Some include um, you know, probable contracts. Some include, and then there's, there's ranges of things. Just make sure they have a consistent definition of what your order book is. In the property market, you can take market cap divided by gross letable area. Uh, now, gross letable area is, if you're a property company, what are you selling? You're selling space. In, in a nutshell, you're selling space. And the more space you have, more you, more arguably you can earn from it. So you take a market up and divide it by that. But once again, gross lethal area can differ from company to company. I mean, you would rent out a factory for a lot less than you'd rent out a hotel. So gross lethal areas, just make sure they have the similar property portfolios or that you, you, work, you work your way around. Lending businesses, you know, Capitec is all the rage and Blue Financial Services is making a comeback. But what is a lending business, a micro-lending business? What is it actually selling? It's selling its loan book. So take the market cap, divide by the loan book. Once again, you know, um, and you start to compare it across them. But careful of a couple of things. Different qualities of loan books. They might have a lot of bad debts sitting in the loan book they haven't written off. They might also have a banking, like a Capitec has a banking side to it. So if you just look at the loan book, you're ignoring the banking side. Um, you can do all of these ratios. I'm talking about market cap. You can use the enterprise value, like I mentioned with mining. You can use, there, there are so many approaches. Um, I mean, we've just touched on a couple broad ones previously, um, and we've just touched on a couple industry specific ratios. But the golden rule is if it moves and can be measured and drives revenue in a listed company, then you can build the ratio out of it. And if you can build the ratio out of it, then you can do a relative valuation out of it. So before we even go to questions, I just want to touch on that all of these ratios are used in the best. There are good ones and there are bad ones, but more importantly, there are relevant ones and there are irrelevant ones. You can do a ratio, divide a market cap, the number of chairs a company has. Who cares? That, that's maybe not driving uh, profits. I can, I can compare market cap... Um, the versus the ounces under the ground between Anglo and Standard Bank. Standard Bank is not a mining company. That's not relevant at all. Those are obvious examples. Just make sure and think about this logically. It's actually a very simple problem. What drives revenue? If it drives revenue, the odds are it's a very relevant and very useful market ratio. So I think we'll jump to questions now, guys. Thanks, Keith. A uh, couple come through. If you've got more questions, uh, throw them in the, in the question box on the GoToWebinar application. We'll certainly take some. We've certainly got time. Um, Sarah says she loved the sector suggestions, and I've got to say, I like that as well. Dude. Different sectors require different things. Um, Simperia asks, so price to sales. He says, 
he, he can see how it works. Petroleum it works better in retail. So for example, a commodity company, and you did allude to we'll talk about them later, they don't control it. They price takers, a lot more volatility. So surely your sort of Mr. Prices, perhaps, or shop rights are better variables than that. Careful on the margins. I mean, Mr. Price, Mr. Price gets uh, very different margins to, because it's mostly cash versus um, good examples. Fashini. Fashini earns most of its money not on gross margins. It actually earns it from finance charges by when you buy on credit. Uh, and, and there's a bit of a convergence between Fashinis of this world, the retailers selling mostly on credit, and actually the micro lenders. Uh, and there, because of the way Ephra states things, your interest. Your, your finance charges and your finance revenue, or finance income in this case, is not included in your sales. It will tend to be uh, below, below the top line. So, yes, um, it's, it's maybe, a, maybe a, an approach, but in, in that case, I'd be very careful of what I'm comparing with what. Cash sales versus cash sales, very comparable. Cash sales versus credit sales, ooh, that's a different game. Mm. Sarah asks if my computer's finished updating. No, it's on 17 out of 20. I hate Windows. Um, a question from Christopher. He says, Peg Roche, he says, he likes Peg. He says he was looking at NASPASS a while ago. Uh, he says and it was 310. That's about 440. So he says PE was 36. Uh, anticipated growth was 48. And that's one of the reasons he got into it. It was growing faster than its PE. Fair comment? A fair comment, but um, now the, this is something you'll see. All these questions are quite specific around companies. So, so I'm going to get quite specific because these ratios, you know, using a generic ratio in, in a broad market, you have to be logical. Is it relevant? And in NASPA's case, the argument can be made that it's, it's becoming an investment company. So, you know, you talk about a forward, uh, a forward growth rate of 40-odd percent, but of what? And sometimes, maybe in NASPA's case, the sum of the parts, the net asset value, the intrinsic value, is more important than the top line of the profits coming in because it isn't accounting for some of those investments. It's just fair value in there, uh, or, or not even in some cases. So, fair point, and maybe NASPA is, is, is where it will work, and, but I'm leaning towards NASPA's is the wrong one to apply that to. Fresh out. He, he followed up with a, 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 a which said the, the challenge, the trick, the, the risk is finding that forward growth number. Absolutely. Particularly, that's that, particularly in a growth stock. Absolutely. And that's why I spend a lot of time. Which growth number? Top line, bottom line? I mean, yeah, you, you've got to, and especially if you start, because the peg ratio in isolation is, is, is useful, but it can also be quite meaningless. The JSC, as a rule, trades at a peg ratio of 0. 0.8 something. Things about 0.85, so it makes the JSC look like the entire market is undervalued, but it trades at that. Uh, um, so, so if you have a peg ratio of 0.8 in NASPERS, but you can buy, you know, maybe um, a VUSA on a peg ratio of 0.6, VUSA looks more attractive. So, choose your growth rate carefully, and then use it consistently across all the companies you're comparing it to. Yeah, it's a good shot, and and it it, it comes into the the, the next question um, from from Gareth, who's, who's asking around. In a sense, you want to take a a, a price to, to sales or something, and actually plot a trend for it. Go and find your company and plot a ten or fifteen year trend, so that you know where it typically will sit relative to its sales. This is where uh, this might be, and I, I hope we don't lose you guys, but um, Google it. It's a very useful term called standard deviation. So w w what I'd like to do is I'll track the historic charts of these relative ratios for all the companies, I mean, as far back as possible. Then you build standard deviation into Now, standard deviation is the normal curve, the bowl-shaped curve, they call it. If something is sitting outside of one standard deviation, either on the upside or on the downside, being overvalued or undervalued, it starts to become much more meaningful. Um, against that historical average, then if it's sitting here a couple percent below. Cool. Uh, Christopher's asking about one time. Yeah, but um, <laughs> someone else, I just replied on Twitter, the whole thing's dodge. Both the trade at two cents and, frankly, the uh, company, airlines, wouldn't take him if you gave them to me. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, and we're pretty much smack on time, so I'm going to leave it there. I, I, 
I, I, I like I really like the, 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 the different the different industries. Look at different methods, different ways to value industries. I think that's very, very important. We've looked at a couple that were relatively broad, certain you know, PEs and E V Badar and the like, price to book, but to delve into particular industries and understand the nuances within that and then take those 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 histories and, and get the standard deviations. Uh, Gareth says, where do you find the data? Unfortunately, Gareth, it's often a lot of PT. You can go and get a service like INET. It costs you money. Otherwise, it's actually going into the results every time and putting them out. Some of the brokers uh, publish some of these ratios, and they've got history going back to sort of mid-90s. But you're not going to get a pretty chart emailed to you. You're going to have to do some sweat. How much will depend. But uh, th this is where I'm going to jump in. That's your advantage in the market. If you're willing to do the legwork, you can beat the market. Yeah, fair point. Most folks don't want the lead work, they want the Rolls Royce. We'll leave it there. Uh, my thanks to Keith McClasson as always, um, and this time particularly for not frying my brain, uh, and for all of you folks for attending. Thanks very much. Cheers all. Thanks, guys. Cheers.